They spray our skies interact with, with the magnetic chemicals. Space travel is a Hi, I'm Rich Lund, and welcome to Debunk the Funk. Last episode, we just scratched the surface of the idea of chemtrails, a conspiracy theory that proposes that nations around the world are using jets and other aircraft to spray their entire populations with some type of dangerous chemical cocktail. Some proponents of chemtrails feel that there's evidence of this in our snow, and in the last episode we put one of those claims to the test. A link to that episode is in the description below if you want to check it out. But this snowball claim is really just one piece of a very large conspiracy theory. And admittedly, it is an idea that some chemtrail enthusiasts do reject. But now, it's time to start looking a bit more at the overall idea. Regardless of whether or not there's evidence of foreign chemicals in our snow, are planes, jets, things of that sort, spraying us with some sort of harmful chemical or chemical mixture? Just exactly what is that? Well, to question and examine just what that is in a fair and honest way, we're going to use two hypotheses. Hypothesis number one. These trails are chemtrails meaning that these are some sort of chemical or chemical mixture that's being intentionally sprayed to cause something to happen that we're not being told about. Precisely what that something is, what chemicals are actually in there, well, that's a topic for another episode. Today we're just looking at whether or not that's a trail of chemicals or a mixture of chemicals that's being sprayed out. Hypothesis number two, that these trails are just water vapor that have condensed. That they're condensation trails, also known as contrails. And what you're visually seeing is harmless water that is now condensed in a visible form. This is the hypothesis that any pilot, any physicist who works in aerodynamics, any meteorologist, and any science teacher is going to tell you about. Now in just a bit, we're going to compare these two hypotheses, but first, I've got to make sure that we're on the same page with physics. I don't know how much physics you know. And while the first hypothesis doesn't require you to know too much, just believe that humans have decided to engineer planes that spray stuff out and not tell us about it, the second hypothesis does require you to understand a few things about how the physics of condensation works. Condensation is when something that's in the gaseous or vapor state changes phase into the liquid state. And it most often occurs when there's a lowering of temperature. We're all familiar with condensation if you've ever enjoyed a really cold beverage on a hot, humid day. When it's a very humid day, there's plenty of water vapor around us. And when that water vapor comes into contact with the surface of a very cold drink, well, it transfers a lot of its energy to that surface. If enough energy is transferred, well, then that gas particle now has too little energy to stay in the gas phase. It now condenses into the liquid phase. And if enough of this is happening in the same location, then you start to be able to observe it. Little droplets and beads on the side of your drink. This is also why the bathroom mirror will fog up when you take a hot, steamy shower. However, for condensation to happen, it doesn't require that a surface is there. It just helps. And when really small solid particles function in this way, we call those nucleation sites. But again, they're not necessary. As long as air is humid enough and the temperature decreases enough, condensation will occur. And so this happens any time that warm, humid air mixes with cold air. Like when you breathe out your warm, humid breath in the winter and you see condensation coming out of your mouth. Or if you open up the lid to a really cold icebox cooler on a hot, humid day. Let me show you a demonstration of this. I have another series called Indie Labs where I show at-home science experiments. Just try to teach some science in some fun, hands-on ways. Well, I've done a demonstration in one of those videos and it could actually help us out here. I have some water in this 2-liter bottle and I have one of these fizz savers. And this product here is meant to twist on where the cap would go, so that way you can then pump in some extra pressure above the soda. It's meant to help your pop stay fizzier for longer. And I also have a temperature strip taped onto here, something that's usually used in aquariums or terrariums. And right now it says it's about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Now something I'm going to do is light a few matches, let them burn a little bit, and then I'm going to blow them out and put them in here. Now that I've done that, I've got plenty of smoke particles up inside of the gas that's in this bottle. Those small little particles are going to serve as nucleation sites for us. Now we're still at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, but I'm going to start adding in some pressure. Let's give it 50 pumps. We're 
at about 82 degrees, approaching 86 degrees. So about 84 degrees, we could say. So almost 10 degrees different than what it was at before. Now, when pressure increases, temperature increases. So we now have some warm air, and because of that extra heat, it's now also humid in here. Let's see what happens when we lower the pressure and thus drastically change the temperature very quickly. And when I do this, I'm going to also use a flashlight so we can see the condensation a little bit easier. Here we go. Three, two, one. Plenty of condensation due to humid air undergoing a rapid decrease in temperature. And just in case anybody would say, no, that condensation formed because of a decrease in pressure, not because of a decrease in temperature, unless you're adding in heat while you do it, when you decrease a gas's pressure, you are decreasing its temperature. That's one of the gas laws known as Guy Lussac's law. Go check out some chemistry on it. Okay, now so far we haven't really done anything debatable here. This is just some physics as to how condensation happens. So now that we're on the same page as far as the physics of condensation goes, let's talk about how a contrail could form. A contrail is the term for a condensation trail. And there's two main ways that a contrail could form. And even if you are a chemtrail enthusiast and you believe in these chemtrails, just understand right now I'm just talking about the physics of how condensation trails could have a chance to form. When a plane or jet moves fast enough, flight occurs because of the air passing over and under the shape of the wings. The wings are shaped so that way the upper top of the wing causes air to have a longer path to have to travel than the underside of the wing. So as it cuts through the air, air that's passing over the top of the wing has to spread out more than air that is underneath the wing. This is Bernoulli's principle and it's been used to fly ever since the Wright brothers. And actually if you count the animal kingdom a lot longer than that. Because the air is spread out more on the top side of the wing, there's less pressure there than what's on the underside of the wing. And it's that imbalance in pressure that causes a push up on the wing and thus the rest of the plane allowing it to be up in the air. Now, the wing's shape causing the air to spread out more, well, that causes a decrease in its pressure. And as we just saw, a rapid decrease in pressure also means a rapid decrease in temperature of that air. And if the air then is humid enough, this is a rapid decrease in temperature of the humidity, the water vapor in the air. In other words, the moist air rapidly becomes colder. These types of contrails are called aerodynamic contrails. They're caused by the warm, humid air temporarily becoming much colder than the surrounding air due to aerodynamic pressure changes. And because the pressure change is only temporary, well, the temperature change is only temporary. And so these contrails, they don't last that long. Pretty quickly, they become the same temperature as the surrounding air again, and the water goes from being condensed to evaporating. In other words, aerodynamic contrails are pretty short-lived. But physics would also say that there's another way that a condensation trail can form. The second way to make a contrail has to do with jet fuel exhaust. Jet fuel is primarily a mixture of kerosene and gasoline, and both of those are mixtures of hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbon compounds, just like the name implies, are only compounds of hydrogen and carbon, and they're great for burning. And as long as enough oxygen is present, when you burn a hydrocarbon, you produce CO2 and H2O. But not liquid H2O, you produce water vapor. The way jet engines work is that they take in air and they condense some of it to make the oxygen more concentrated. Helps in burning the fuel. When jet fuel mixes with the condensed air, a spark ignites the reaction and the jet fuel burns. And it's this rapid production of CO2 and water vapor that causes the thrust that pushes the jet forward. Now if you followed all that, you also understand the exhaust coming out of these jet engines is a very warm mixture of gases, primarily CO2 and water vapor. And this very warm, moist, humid exhaust is expelled and allowed to mix with the much cooler surrounding air. And just in case you weren't aware, the higher you are up in altitude, the colder the air gets. So the warm water vapor that's in this expelled gas is now mixing with the much cooler air, and voila, condensation occurs. This type of contrail is called an exhaust contrail. And they seem to persist for much longer. Why? Well, think back to aerodynamic contrails. That's where the water vapor was already in the air and it just temporarily became much colder. Exhaust contrails involve producing new water that wasn't there before. And that water vapor is quickly cooled to the surrounding air temperature. And once it's at that cooler air temperature, it's staying at that cooler air temperature. So in other words, once it condenses because of this way, it stays condensed. 
For exhaust contrails, the conditions at that altitude were already capable of keeping water condensed. There just needed to be a good source of water vapor, and the jet engine supplied it. And sometimes, at higher altitudes, the cold air mixing with the exhaust is cold enough to cause not just condensation, but to cause the water particles to actually freeze into little ice crystals. When this happens, those ice crystals can act as nucleation sites, making the condensation even more pronounced. Now that we understand the physics of how contrails should be able to form, let's go back to our two hypotheses and examine them. Is there a way that we can test out these two ideas? Well, there definitely is, and this gets at the core of debunking. When you have two proposed claims, one way to test them out is to see if the two make different predictions under the same circumstances. And in this case, these two different hypotheses, that either planes are spraying chemtrails on us, or that contrails are coming off of these jet engines and wings, they do make two different predictions. See, I'll let you in on a little secret that's actually not at all a secret. Chemtrails do exist. Check it out. Here, we're seeing some crop dusting. This is the spraying of aerosol pesticides. And here's some spraying of DDT back in 1958. Here's what real chemtrails look like. And here's... wait a minute, what's this? This is a commercial airline. And, and look, it's, it's spraying some sort of chemical out of a hose. Yep, that's an airline spraying out some unburned jet fuel. It's a quite well-known, fully disclosed, open and honest procedure. Jets carry more fuel than they need. Think about it, it makes sense. If the unexpected happens and they have to take a detour, they need some extra fuel to be able to do that. Also, they have some extra just in case the ride is really bumpy, extra turbulence, they have to go around a storm. But if the flight goes just as planned and there is very little turbulence, really smooth sailing, the flight might be coming into land with more fuel than it needs. And this can make that jet heavy. In some cases, if a jet is too heavy, it can be unsafe for a landing. But usually it just means more extra wear and tear on the jet, landing heavier than they'd like it to be. And the cost of maintenance of landing a heavy plane often is actually more than the cost of the jet fuel that they expel. I've seen some videos claiming that this is evidence of the chemtrail conspiracy. Eh, sorry, but no. Now, here's the two different predictions that these two different hypotheses make. If a plane or jet really were to be spraying out chemicals, all forms of well-known chemical spraying show that these chemicals are coming directly out of the craft somewhere. Whether we're talking about crop dusting, DDT, or even jet planes releasing fuel. So our first hypothesis predicts that if we are really seeing chemicals being sprayed by planes, there should be no separation between the trail and the craft itself. However, if instead these trails are due to condensation, if they're actually contrails, our second hypothesis then predicts that there should be some separation from the craft to the trail, because it takes some amount of time for that water vapor to condense. So according to our first hypothesis, the chemtrail hypothesis, there should be no separation. According to the second, the condensation hypothesis, there should be a separation from the craft to the condensation trail. So what do we actually see? Here's a clip from a chemtrail video. And there's a pretty large separation, isn't there? Now put some thought into this. If this plane has a chemical that it's spraying out, where is that chemical from here to here? What about this one? Or this one? Or this one? While I don't know if they shot it themselves or not, all this footage has been used in different chemtrail conspiracy theory videos purported as evidence that our governments are spraying us with dangerous chemicals. And if we actually look at them with the physics in mind, and comparing them to real chemtrail situations like crop dusting, they completely fit the idea of physics condensation, and don't look at all like real chemical spraying. While not in every chemtrail conspiracy theory video I've seen do they bring this up, but in plenty, I've also seen them describe how suspicious these chemtrails look because they are white, hazy, and persist for a long time in the sky. Well, I can also immediately think of something else that is white, hazy, and persists for a long time in the sky. A cloud, which is just another form of condensation. Next episode, we're going to dig even deeper into this chemtrail conspiracy idea. So if you found this one interesting, the next Debunk the Funk will not disappoint. Subscribe now, so that way you don't miss out. And if you like this video, hey, that thumbs up like is always appreciated. 
And if you don't like that physics just poked a major hole in this chemtrail idea, well then the thumbs down button is somewhere there too. I'm Rich Lund, thanks for watching, and remember, the world needs critical thinkers. Make sure you're one of them. See you next time.